we want to be the facilitator, not the focus. And I still really believe that for community generally, especially if you're an entity like a brand or a creator who mm -hmm. is the, the entity bringing people together, you should think of yourself as the facilitator of that community, yeah. right? It's like such a, a, a powerful and amazing thing to be able to bring people together yeah. around like, because you know that they have shared interests or shared experience. Um, but the beautiful thing about it that is different from what, you know, building an audience on social media looks like is you don't have to be the focus and you shouldn't be. You can be the facilitator and um, allow the community to really build, build it with you. Kim, welcome to the podcast. I'm so me. excited to talk all things community building, your journey. I feel like your career is insane. Do you feel that? Like when you look at your resume, are you like, holy shit, like, Actually, yeah. Um, no, <laughs> I guess I'm really odd if I said like yes, but no, not really. I think I've only worked two places, and so for me, it's like, um, you know, for so long, I was at, I was, I'd just been at one company. I was at Into the Gloss and Glossier for seven right. years, um, which Loyal. is a long time. Loyal, in like, which 20s, is rare. Don't you 20s. feel like it's yeah. rare for our generation? To yeah, stay at a place for, for sure, long. for sure. Um, um, but it did feel like working at three different companies. I think I've just gotten really lucky in a way, you know. Yeah, but so I think far. it's also a testament to your work ethic. I, I mean, I, I don't know exactly how you worked in those places, but I feel like what those brands have evolved to be I feel yeah. like only people that have strong work ethic and great you know output would continue I always to grow tell people too like and I guess we'll talk about this but when I was in college and I went to Barnard in the city and everyone was always like it was like Teen Vogue was the place to intern you know? mm -hmm. everyone was wanted the Teen Vogue internship and I interned and in, interned it into the gloss because I just like loved it and it, it was not glossy at the time. Like it was a three person right. team and I loved it and I believed in it so much. So I wanted to work there and it blossomed into something like much bigger than I could have imagined at the time. And I think that's why I always tell people like go for the thing that you love, you know, especially when you're young and you're interning and you're trying to figure out what you want to do. Go for the thing that like really excites you, even if it's small or or whatever. Um and I think that that's been like a kind of through line of my career journey so far. I'm so excited to hear because like the jump that you made to Geneva, I'm really curious to know. I feel like you must have an eye for like something that you love, but also something that has mad potential, you know? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe. Because like, I mean, if you were there and it was into the gloss with a team of three people to what it is now. Yeah. I love that. Okay. Yeah. Well, I want to get into your whole journey. But before we do, I want to know what you were like as a kid. Like, what was your personality like? Because I feel like a community role yeah. is very specific. It takes a specific type of character. And I'm just, I'm always so curious with my guests on what little version of them was like. Yeah. And like, what personality traits do you think are still in your personality now? So it's funny. It's kind of ironic. I was really shy. Like, I was painfully shy as a child to the point that my teachers would be like, is she okay? <laughs> My parents were like, she's fine. She just doesn't want to speak to anyone. Um, yeah, I was selective. painfully selective, you know. I was painfully shy as, a shy, shy as a child, which I think made me, I actually think it really primed me for the work that I do now because I always say that I think the best community people have to be very observant and have to be like super empathetic. And I think that you gain those qualities when you're someone who just is very shy and like, and more of an observer than kind of a like active, you know, participant in certain ways. Um, and so that was kind of like one of the core elements of my, my childhood, honestly, it was, was that. And I think a lot of the things about that and about being, you know, a little liking to be a little bit on the sidelines or like watching was like kind of what helped me be a community person. But I think as I got older, the fact that I was able to like come out of that shell, especially in my early 20s when I was actually at Into the Gloss, was a, the kind of catalyst for me starting to do community work. What about like the creativity side? Because I feel like even being drawn to an Into the Gloss and I saw that you yeah. interned at Refinery, like yeah. what was it about those things? Um, I, I love talking about just like 
my my biggest thing that I'm like obsessed with is people who just like are born knowing exactly what it is that they want. Oh my God, the majority of us don't. The I majority know, of us I like know. try things, fail, don't like it, like it, like whatever. So like, I don't know. Like I just, I'm so curious when people like see something and then they know and they go for it. Like, yeah. how did you know? <laughs> I had no idea. Like I, I'm obsessed with that too because I've never been that Like person. when people are like doctors doctors i know one Lawyers. of my one of my closest friends is a photographer he's going to be a photographer for his entire life like that is his thing that he does yeah. and he loves it and he'll never stop loving it and my mind cannot comprehend what that must be like from like the age i crave of, like, it 16. i'm like yeah same i'm like that well, what's, what's that like you yeah know, it's just so interesting to me but or to even have that like depth of obsession with like one thing is so cool to me I but know. I'm not that person at all. <laughs> like, I wish I was. I used to wish I was. I kind of don't anymore. Same. I kind same. of love when the I started journey, the podcast. You know? I wished like if you hear my earlier yeah. episodes, the questions that I'm asking are clearly because like I wanted that for myself. Yeah. And now I've just realized I don't know. I'm obsessed with human design right now, and I'm just leaning into totally who the hell I am. Totally. And it's like, girl, you're never gonna be the the person that just likes one thing. You're no, a thousand percent. I've I've totally come to terms with that too, and I think the journey is really fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I had no idea what I wanted to do. I think when I was younger, I knew I really wanted to be in New York, which I think is like a classic teen girl. I mean, yeah, thing. But um, you made it happen. That's different. Yeah, made it happen, and then. And I'm, I, I'm a huge believer that, like, it's just as, if not more, valuable to know what you don't like than it is to know what you do like. And so I learned that, like, sitting at home and trying to, like, write, you know, a bunch of stories in a week was not the thing that I enjoyed. But isn't um, it fascinating that there are people that, like, literally live for that? Totally. Totally. It, it like, was – it boggled my mind. <laughs> um, but it was a great experience. And, right. like – I learned that that wasn't my thing. And every one of the roles, were you like finding a little more clarity? Like, were you like, okay, like definitely not this, but now I tried this and there's definitely more, uh, you're dealing with more people in an ad, in an ad role. Yeah. So like, was there that component that you were like, I like this and I don't like this? You know, I think the biggest thing that I realized, especially when I was at Into the Gloss and kind of transitioning into ads and, and exploring that space it was less the people element because it was such a different kind of relationship with people. It was so salesy, mm -hmm. which I just was like, not really, it wasn't really my thing. Um, and some people are so good at that and they like live for that. They yeah. like, live for the deal. My dad was a salesperson when I'm like, no, thank <laughs> you. Um, and it actually, the, the theme, the consistent theme for me was I loved the people that I was working with like so much. And, I felt like I had learned so much from them, even in all of these different roles that I was in. Um, and so that that was kind of the the thing that I was like, OK, even if I don't love this role or this work, the fact that I'm here learning so much from people who like are taking the time to invest in me felt really good. And then you were like, I would like to get a better understanding of how all of this works. I guess yeah. like thinking of the listener, like what's yeah. like a takeaway that we can say like, yeah. or how, how you went about it, I guess. Yeah. So at the time, um, so basically the journey was I started doing ad sales as an intern, mm -hmm. but I was kind of just jack of all trades intern really yeah. at a certain point at FCG. all interns. Yeah. <laughs> um, like I was like managing the other interns, just like doing a lot. And Glossier launched that year that I was a senior in college. Okay. Um, and so about nine months into the brand launching, they were like, why are we doing ad sales on into the gloss? If we now have brand, like we don't really need to do that. Right makes sense and but I had just started full-time doing ad sales just graduated college so I was like yeah <laughs> my <laughs> job sense. my job um and so I was like okay I'm gonna start you know looking at stuff and this is this is really connected to what you were saying earlier I had no idea what existed like I had no idea even when I was like I want to do marketing and I started doing ad sales like those are two different things totally <laughs> those are people not still the same don't thing. understand that like not when I, they, well, I do PR and they're like oh so you like 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 Don Draper and I'm like oh. <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> no <laughs> exactly exactly I had no like concept of the fact that these are different things and so and of course when I was like, I'm going to do marketing and, you know, trying to figure that out, I was like, I'm going to go do PR because I didn't know what else I didn't mm -hmm. know what else marketing was like. I just was so green yeah. and I just hadn't seen that much. And so um, I was applying other places, but Emily was and the team were really, really like 
you can find something here. Like we have a brand now. There's so many things that you can do here. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I just kind of like shout out for like a month. I just kind of like, oops. There you go. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) For a month, I just kind of like observed and like watched what other people did. Um, And I think that the way that that happened is one on it being totally honest like I had built such a relationship with the team that it that that was like something that they encouraged me to Mm do um but also I think when you're young and you kind of like exhibit a real curiosity I think that goes a long way Mm -hmm. you know I think that when you're young and you're like a hard worker and you're like I want to know what I don't know people respect that a lot um and I just kind of felt it out until we were like, what about community? <laughs> so what year that. was that when your community role developed? Cause I feel like community is like the talk of the town, literally at every panel, like everyone's like, you need to be investing in community. How do you do it? I want to know what that was like. Set this, t- set the tone of like what community was at that point. Yeah. Um, cause I feel like it's evolved. Yeah. So that was 2015. <sighs> um, Completely so the, different. yeah, it's like such a different time. Um, the brand was like less than a year old we had you know into the gloss had been around for like four or so years so i was community and um product coordinator and so i did i mean just a i was doing like user insights before we had like professional user insights people like analog but, but it was so cool because i literally would just like call people up and be like hey you are you purchased like 20 times from us i love that it was like so (laughs) unprofessional but i love that it it (laughs) it was so fun and i think it really built especially because the brand was so young and so new and so the people who were buying from us at the time were really kind of excited about it or invested in it it built this real human relationship between our most engaged customer Mm -hmm. and the company and like what we were building um and there wasn't really a precedent and so i didn't i didn't know you're literally making it up did you make up up. that role like you said i'm gonna do something and call it community no i had a conversation with emily and she was like we have this we have community but we don't have anyone leading it maybe you should do it and i was like i don't even know what that means but i'll i'll do it that sounds cool yeah sounds interesting to me um and then yeah and and it just kind of evolved from there and so I started doing that role started just like trying to learn about customers I hosted our first event about like a month in which was in our penthouse in is our that like office. with with uh customers or is that like influencer no. no it was like a totally that was I think the biggest difference for me and the work that I was doing versus I think a lot of my peers like one a lot of companies did not have a community role Mm -hmm. at the time and so I didn't have a lot of peers who were doing that work but but if they did it tended to just be like social media or influencer because we honestly didn't do a lot of big big influencer stuff early on a lot of it was really just community and any of the content creators or influencers who we did really engage with were customers so I feel Um, like that I mean just Glossier as a whole I think is a unicorn because of that like I think that they set a tone for community I think when you think of a brand that actually has community which is so cool that I'm talking to you who was like literally the lead of it that was creating it when there was like you said no precedent for it and I feel like now 2022 going into 2023 that is literally the thing that is most top of mind for brands so I'm curious like it's seeing the community space evolve and like you said like like even within that role you saw it first be customers and then kind of like be a mix of influencer and customer where do you see it going like what do you think is actually going to move the needle within community today um and how yeah like how you see it and how you approach it so I I have this hot take that I don't think every brand needs a community which is like maybe not aligned with the work that I do but I just I think that we have entered into this era where community is kind of like a commodity commoditized yeah is that the right mm-hmm. word? commodified concept um and <laughs> <Commoditized> was right <laughs> like yes you're like yes exactly and you're doing great I'm gonna say, yeah um <laughs> <laughs> it made sense to me I know you got the picture um <laughs> is it just like a commodified concept and I think 
a lot of people don't really know what it means anymore. And I think especially for brands, you know, because brands see other brands that have done community really well and that in tandem have grown and like skyrocketed in terms of their success as brands, there's this kind of equation with community and like fast skyrocket growth and success as a company. And I don't think that that's, um, I think that that's like a short sighted way to understand what community is. Um, what is community? Let's take a step back. What is community? Like, how do you define community? Yeah. Um, yeah. For someone listening that they're, I mean, I have a lot of people that are in like the marketing and like, just like startup space, but for someone who's listening, who has no idea. The biggest thing that I would say is I think it's like a group of people who come together around shared interest experience or whatever. And I think the biggest thing about community that I see um, people have trouble with is that it's built the the space, the environment, the community is built um, collectively and collaboratively. Right. It's not built top down. It's not built by one person. It is a collaborative experience that everyone is a stakeholder in. Um, how the hell do you do that? <laughs> like, I think how I think does, you, you. How does that happen? You know, I, it's funny, and this is why. And we'll talk about this later. But I, I'm a, such a big believer right now that like creators, content creators, I guess you could say, on the internet are going to be the people or the next iteration of like true community builders online. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I think that they, there are so many people who are coming together around interest, whether it's wellness or, you know, starting your first job or thrifting in Dallas or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they want people to connect with around their, like the things that they love and care about. And right now we live in a society or like a digital world that kind of prioritizes one person's voice that speaks to the masses but I think we're moving into a world where those one those creators can like create worlds communities that allow for democratized conversation and connection and all of that and so I think creators are going to be like the next I think they're going to build the next iteration of what community looks like online mm-hmm. um but but to get back to your earlier question the thing I will say about community and brands is I think where the space will go is that communities will actually like brands will form out of communities as opposed to the other way around. Interesting. Um, so, you know, August, which is a period care brand started Literally, by Nadia Okamoto, who's incredible. Nadia is insane. She's, yeah, she's unreal. a beast. Yeah. She is. If you're listening, Nadia, you're just incredible. Yeah. She's unreal. My question is, so for someone who's like launching something, yeah. doing something before you have product and it's just like community, how do you, where do you find those people first? Like did for inner cycle, for example, like yeah. where do you find those people first that have that same interest? Yeah. Yeah. So I think the interesting thing about the inner cycle is that Nadia had this kind of, um, really like respected and known role in the period Mm -hmm. activism space already right and so I think for her she again had all these people and this is why um I wouldn't even I don't know if she would have considered herself a creator at that time but like she had this following of people who are all interested and invested in the same thing that she was Mm -hmm. and what she did is she took that following and she allowed those people to kind of like come together and like have conversation and connection in a way that just was more democratized and more um I guess like one level deeper from where like what social media does and so that was kind of like a natural kind of evolution of the following and the role that she had built for herself um but I also think that what they did that I thought was cool was like invited members to invite a friend right and just like have your people kind of like bring their people essentially and like Um, your people connect with each other I feel like that's the reason even why I start I'm trying to figure out this active ingredient community because every time that I speak to one of them like one-to-one I'm like they all would be friends. Totally. Like, I, first of all, I want to be friends with you. Totally. And second, like, I know that you would be friends with this person who's based in Miami. Like, why can't we all be in one place? And I don't have to be like the person that's connecting. It's just like you guys connect with each other because we all have the same common denominator. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's I used to say at Glossy all the time, like, we want to be the facilitator, not the focus. 
And I still really believe that for community generally, especially if you're an entity like a brand or a creator who mm -hmm. is the, the entity bringing people together, you should think of yourself as the facilitator of that community, yeah. right? It's like such a, a, a powerful and amazing thing to be able to bring people together yeah. around like, because you know that they have shared interests or shared experience. Um, but the beautiful thing about it that is different from what, you know, building an audience on social media looks like is you don't have to be the focus and you shouldn't be. You can be the facilitator and um, allow the community to really build build it with you. Yeah. So what in your time at Glossier was like the biggest learning within building community that you took? And then why Geneva? I think one of my biggest learnings with that was that... <laughs> It's, it can be really hard when you're building community and it's working and you're like building relationships with people and, you know, you're just building this whole kind of ecosystem and world of, of um, or experience for your closest people. When that is successful and people are loving it, you, you want to scale it up as much as possible. And that's where like the challenge comes. Right. Um, and so I, I definitely learned how challenging it can be when you are trying to continue building on, you know, mm -hmm. the community that you've started. Um, but you also want to do it thoughtfully and you want to do it intentionally and you don't want to do it in a way that, um, loses its value. Loses its value. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like it's a fine line because the whole point is for it to be like inclusive and everyone's invited and, you know, and then yeah. at the same time, it's like, so how do you how do you make it something that's different than what's being offered to just like masses? Totally, you know? totally. And then the other thing that and this is seems kind of simple, but I really think it's um, it's not. And I, I talk to especially brands about it a lot now just with work at Geneva. You really have to see yourself as, you know, when you're a community manager as this kind of central point between the brand or the company and the people and um the biggest thing that you want to do when like creating in a community experience is like completely humanize yourself, the brand, um, and create an environment where all conversation is, op is welcome. And so, you know, in our community, like if people didn't like a product, they would say it, you know what I mean? If yeah. they were like this new thing launched and I am not into it girls and here is why. Yeah. And I would show up in the conversation as Kim. They knew I was Kim from Glossier, but, um, I think that creating that environment, a lot of brands especially, um, it can be scary to give up that kind of power or control mm -hmm. when you're building a community, but you have to. Yeah. That's the way that you create trust and you create real relationships. Um, so I think I think all of those things were some of the biggest learnings. So you think like the takeaway is slow and steady? Slow and steady, um, you know, watering over time. Communities need care. Really and not every brand needs a community and not every brand needs a community. I mean, look, I, I think that some companies like every company will have its value mm -hmm. customers. Right. Amazon doesn't need a community. <laughs> we, we don't we don't identify with Amazon's brand. Yeah. We like that it's quick and it's accessible and it's easy. totally I don't need and to I, talk to everyone that uses Amazon because it's yeah, everyone. Yeah. And I think that like sometimes you have to be real um, as a company about like what is the value that you provide from people aside from the, the product that you're selling? Right. Um, for Glossier, a lot of the value was the brand and the feel and it feeling really different from beauty brands that people had experienced before. And so naturally you see yourself in that. Um, and when you see yourself in that, there's a whole bunch of other people who see themselves in that too. And so it's only natural and only makes sense to build a community around like loving beauty or, different stages of, you know, life as it relates to beauty. There were so many different kinds of conversations that we had, but it all came from a very similar kind of um, ethos that I think a lot of the customers and community members at that time really shared. Hmm. I'm, I'm just picking up like energetically wise and just like literally from seeing all the different points and, and the years in which you like were joining these things and how these things evolved and conceptualizing these first ever types of programs. Like I get the vibe that you're someone who just sees things before they become it and then they become it. I think that um, I always say to people that going with my gut is my hard skill because 
one it is like first of all I think going with your gut is like if you can really trust that you'll go far girls how like, did you how did you uh cultivate that like uh, do you remember when you like figured out like oh shit no my gut is right all the time it, it I can't even say because it is just a way that I've always been um that's such a gift yeah it's very weird and sometimes it's like a little much like I'm like no you know <laughs> my friends are so like hard. girl I'm like let me ignore that one yeah and it's exactly like, it comes back and slaps you in the face <laughs> yeah. and it's like no no yeah my friends are like girl we get it we get it your god says no um but yeah I don't know I've always been like that honestly um and I feel like it's done me pretty well. Yeah, I think I'm a kind of an intuitive person. And I think I also, um, I, when I get excited about something, I want to know like more, you know? And so with Geneva, it was like, I knew it was about the company for a year before I joined. Mm -hmm. And I would just, like have coffee with Justin, the founder, because at the I when I was at Glossy, I built Glossy's community on Slack um, in 2015. He was like, you know, you built Glossy's community on Slack, and I want to know about that because I'm trying to build this app that's like purpose built for communities. And I was like, well, that's cool, that's interesting. Um, and we just got along really well, and I was really into the vision of what he was trying to build. But I was like. I have my job. I'm good to go. You know, mm -hmm. good luck with everything. Um, but I wanted to stay connected. Like I just, I, I was like, I need to know what's going on. That gut, you know, that gut like, I'm is like, speaking. <laughs> so yeah. And then a year later in 2020, summer 2020, in that chaotic time, I was like, I think it's my time to learn something new, basically. So it was wrong. really the root of, of so talk to us about what Geneva is. Yeah. And so clearly the founder is some, someone that like really pulled you in. He was like explaining something that caught your attention. Um, but what is Geneva? Uh, yeah. What is Geneva? Who's it for? Um, what's the purpose of it? How do people use it? My community knows about it. Like the listeners yeah. have heard me talk about it probably like three or four times Yeah. on the show. Um, but yeah, I want to hear it from you. Yeah. What is it? Yeah. Um, I think in the simplest terms, Geneva is a messaging app for communities and for social groups. So what that looks like, um, in terms of who we're for is literally everything from like sororities, book clubs, k-pop fan clubs the bachelor watch party groups all of which exist on geneva to brand brand ambassador programs creator-led communities podcast communities activist groups everything in the like 10 to tens of thousands range um and the way that we think about what we're building or the way i think about what we're building is we sit at this kind of intersection of being a like easy accessible chat app mm -hmm. but with all of the tools that like large communities need um so what that means is you have every way to communicate you have like basically you have instagram live built in you have facetime slash zoom built in you have chat you have posting you have event calendar you have all this stuff that like a community that's a little bit more organized or a little bit larger than just like your average group chat needs. Mm -hmm. um, but in a place that is not like clunky or <laughs> boring for lack yeah. of a better term, that's fun and easy to use. Um, and that's kind of, that's the the mission. And, the and is it completely free? Totally free. Um, later next year, we'll probably build some like pro tools into the app, but totally free. Interesting. Know? Yeah. Um, I, I'm curious, like within the people that are on Geneva right now, cause I still think it's very early on yeah, and like the people sure. who, who know, know, and then like, hopefully now more people know when yeah. it starts to grow. Um, what do you find is like the thing that makes those Geneva communities be mo the most successful? Like, is it like someone who's like, who would be like the Kim or like the community lead that's like constantly in there checking things, like talking to people or like, yeah, I'm curious, like what works? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it depends a lot. So like how a sorority is successful on Geneva is so different from like how a podcast community is successful. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, for most of the communities, especially the larger ones, success is driven by the members taking part, taking ownership, driving conversation, 
um, just as much as, if not more sometimes, than the kind of leader community kind of facilitator. And I think that that creating an environment where your members are true participants, stakeholders in the community is really, I think, one of the biggest things that drives, you know. Okay, but how does one do that? (laughs) Like, how does one do that? Because like, all I know yeah. with active ingredients community is that they rock yeah. and that there's so much in common within yeah. like, each other. But I don't I, like I have no idea what the next step is. So you know? I think there's a couple of things very tactically. Um, one of the things I always talk to people about is like you want to have a balance. I would say like if we're going to get really serious, like 60, 40 of rooms. So pulling back every community or a group on Geneva is called a home and Mm -hmm. then within your home you have rooms and rooms are basically like channels but what's cool is that every you have five different room types so you have chat post um audio live audio live Mm -hmm. video broadcast you can really have all these types of conversations live events anything you want to do with your members um and the first thing that I would say is that you want to have a balance of rooms that are kind of oriented around, you know, you or, you know, things like announcements, right? Things that you can kind of use to share out information or share out events that are coming up and rooms that are totally member driven conversation. And you want to, you want to over index on rooms that are like fully for your members. So things like having a room for wins so that people can like drop in on Fridays, like, Oh my God, you guys, I just got an A on my test or I just got a promotion, right? That kind of stuff. Or even rooms for vent. I see a lot of communities with like a little vent room where people can just like share frustrations at work or something like that. And and it allows for members to really um, lead and and have space for, for leading conversation. Um, so I would say one is that I always kind of, especially for a brand or a creator, if if it's a lot if a lot of the rooms are oriented towards them. I try to help them kind of pull back and say, okay, let's like orient these towards things that your members might want to talk about or contribute to, or that yeah. might be more kind of um, personal to them. Interesting. So that's one. Two is um, I do think to your point earlier, generally community members kind of model the behavior of the person who brought them there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it is really important that as like the person who's the facilitator of the community, you are modeling the behavior that you want to see. Right. Um, but a lot, but what that means is not like announcement through, you know, we've got like, you know, big announcements or, um, you know, big brother kind of vibes. It means you show up as like just a real human and, um, and your members will too, like they really will model that and, and see you showing up that way and do that themselves. And then what you can do, and I've seen this really kind of like help, um, many communities that have grown to be in the many thousands, um, really, really kind of evolve beautifully is you can create, you know, a kind of sub community within your space of members who are kind of like co contributors or, um, co-owners of the space, right? So maybe they're the people who welcome new members. Maybe they start conversation. Um, Code with Classy, who's on Geneva, calls that their hype squad, which is really cute. I love that. Um, but yeah, I think it's all about just like orienting towards organic conversation um, and, you know, as the leader being the facilitator, first and foremost. I love that. So what's next for for community building? I feel like I'm also really curious about like in the what's next conversation, yeah. how you view the digital space converting to IRL and like the need that I feel like we're, I've said this so many times on the podcast, but we're in a loneliness pandemic. Yeah. And that's why I love platforms like this that are really yeah. like encouraging other people to just connect with each other. And still though, that in-person element is a part to it. So I'm curious how you guys are thinking about that and how to like best go about it. It's so funny because one of the fastest growing community types on Geneva is um, local communities. And so I said thrifting in Dallas because there's a thrifting in Dallas community on Geneva. There's like a Chicago craft club. There's like Muslim women in NYC. Um, And a lot of those communities, what's so beautiful about them is that they're coming together digitally, but the goal is to come together IRL. And I think that that's so needed and it's why we're seeing so much of that growth right Mm -hmm. now. Um, 
And I think that that's actually going to be a big part of the future, to be honest with you. I think the like merge of IRL to online community um, will become more and more important, especially as we're all in the house. We all spend more time on our phones and on our computers. Um, You want to find the people in your neighborhood or in your area who identify like you do or Mm -hmm. who care about the things that you care about. Um, So I think that'll be a huge part of like the next you know, few years for us. We think of Geneva in some ways as a successor to Facebook groups, right? Like we are serving, you know, communities of all shapes and sizes for all people. Um, But, you know, where we see a lot of the love for Geneva is in like the Gen Z and millennial space because people are like, I don't, you know, I'm like trying to find a new place to go Mm -hmm. to build a space for my people super exciting fun yeah it's super super exciting like I think of myself and like I think everyone can relate to like trying to make friends when you're an adult is very difficult it's really really difficult there it's like a time thing it's like a you kind of start to get to know yourself a little bit more and then you have things that like are just non-negotiables about like how people view things or like whatever but I feel like this is a place where it's like you're ruling out a lot of like the trial and error of making friends as an adult and you're kind of just like getting to the point like shit we both like the same thing like let's go get coffee and see if we vibe. Yeah and I also think that like we're so multifaceted as people and sometimes we have this idea that our friends have to represent every piece have to you know be connected with every piece of who we are Mm -hmm. and I think there's something and this is one of the things that I've seen especially in some of the local communities on Geneva, or even just generally, like talking to people on Geneva who are like, I'm in CMOS girlies and I'm also in hiker kind and I'm also in, you know, the inner cycle Mm -hmm. and all of these spaces kind of speak to different things that I love or that I'm interested in or that are me. Mm -hmm. And I have different friends in these different pockets of world. But the fact that you're able to get opened up to people who, you know, maybe you just craft together and that's it. And, yeah. that's, and that's okay. Um, I think is a really, really that's cool. That's so true. It's such a cool evolution of, I think how, you know, as adults, we think about building relationships with people. Yeah. Um, so I get really excited about that. I'm too. curious, like on a personal level, how do you, or how have you cultivated your own community? I think I'm like still in the process of it, to be honest. Um, I think that I, I'm someone who like, when I am very like, I'm a very loyal person. So when I um, build a relationship with someone, I feel I'm like, we're here, you know? Yeah. Like we're really not going anywhere. <laughs> um, and, but I, I, I actually think that I'm very much in progress when it comes to cultivating my own community. And I, I think I actually have been, especially recently, like spending, the biggest thing that I've told myself lately is like default to yes. Um, I think there was a period of time, especially like during the pandemic, where I would default to no in terms of like things that I got invited to Mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever, especially if I was like, I don't know anyone there or whatever. And I've been of the mind in the past couple months of defaulting to yes. And that I think is a huge element of cultivating my community, especially locally and like in the city that I live Mm -hmm. in. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges of like, especially cultivating relationships and community IRL is is like building that kind of ritual with someone where you know how you kind of show up with each other you know totally Um, which is like I feel like we don't really talk about it's so true like okay this is my thing and I don't know if you're gonna feel like I see that I love to be around people but as soon as like I need to go I gotta go I got to go. Oh, girl. And so like this is I feel like we should normalize that. Like if I'm like, I want to be the person that invites people over to like have dinner. But it's like I need you to leave in two hours. A thousand percent. Like, how do we do that? Because like I want to have that type of community. But like that's one of those things that I'm like, guys, like get out. I definitely get that. And I'm very much someone who like can spend all day. Same. So low, dolo and be very happy about it. It's like when I go to talk to that first person, though, at the end of the day that I'm like, oh, my words sound weird. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my you God. Know? I totally, totally got that. <laughs> a thousand percent. It's like, oh, human. Yeah. How do we do this? I'm like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, uh. my mom's like, what? Yeah. OK, guys. Uh, so like a takeaway from this is like, let's just normalize like leaving <laughs> yeah. like early 
and like saying like let's hang out for one hour yeah i am obsessed i used to be so shocked by people i have a couple people in my life who like are really really big irish exiters as they say as they call it one of them Uh, i early on in my life i was like that is so crazy and then i was like and then i got to a point where i was like i really respect that yeah and now i'm like i am that I am that. I mean, a thousand percent. (laughs) But I do think that like having touch points with people in person is so important. And I think that like it's like we're in this weird intersection in life right now where I feel like we're so lonely, but we're also so scared to have human interaction. (laughs) Yeah, a thousand percent. And like we don't want to like overcommit to being with someone for like that long and not knowing how to get out of it. So like I think this might be a solution. I'm telling you, though, like the mental shift of like telling myself to default to yes to things has really actually been a big shift. I love that. Um, And I don't know. Everyone's different. And, you know, maybe there are people who already do that and are like, girl, I'm exhausted of that and it's not helping. But um, for the people like me who are, you know, introverted and can spend all day in the house or whatever, um, it's been like a huge, yeah, a huge shift. And I think it's also like a seasonal thing. Like not like literally like in the seasons of like earth. Like I mean like seasons of life. Like there are times where like no is more important and there are times when yes is more important. And it's just like you said, having that gut connection yeah and cultivating that to know which one is the real voice yeah sometimes it's like it's saying no and then you're like is that (laughs) is that like the easy answer and I have to say like the things that I have been like oh I don't know if I didn't but then I go lately have been the some of the most like joyful things experiences that I've had recently yeah um what's your routine right now if you don't mind sharing um my routine right now is well, it's pretty simple. I do morning pages, which is a, like, mm-hmm. yeah, from the artist way. So I do that every morning, um, which is huge for me. And then I, on usually one page, one and a half, I start making tea. And then by page three, the tea is boiling. So then I make the tea. What type of tea get, get specific? Chai with oat milk. Love. And then I drink the tea and then I do a little workout usually 20 minutes not a big workout girl what type of workout a little Pilates love yeah and then that's like the core of my routine then I go get a shower do all the normal things I love that I feel alive in routines too yeah and they evolve does your routine evolve at all um no stays the same not evolved so mine didn't evolve no mine didn't evolve for a really long time all of a sudden I was like I don't know actually if I'm a morning workout person like I think there's some mornings where I am and then there's some where like an evening hot yoga flow actually is what my body needs yeah so I'm like a little bit thrown off course because I've I've been a routine girl for literally like as long as I can remember it's kind of funny now that you say that because I actually have started doing evening workouts um, and maybe it's because I feel really in flow right now with my routine, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm like open to a little bit of like evolution without yeah. being scary. I know. Why is it so scary? I know. Cause it's, you know why? You off. Cause you know why? Because it served you, it served you and it's taken you to a certain point. So then you're scared of like changing it. Totally. And I think also like for me, I, I feel flow in and out so like I can fall off my routine really easily so when I'm on it I'm like I like hold on yeah you know yeah, yeah, um yeah. but like you know over the summer it's like when you're traveling a lot or yeah whatever I just I totally can fall off really easily it's like totally kind of just something I know about myself and so when I'm in it I like really try to like cherish it and yeah. hold on as long as possible <laughs> <laughs> same okay I have two more questions yeah. what is something that you feel like you've had to unlearn to then relearn to get to the place that you're at today? I have always been someone connected to being shy, who ha- is who is very good at like boundaries. Um, and I think that's, you know, the default to yes thing, like all of that stuff is connected to that for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and in a way, I actually do think I've had to kind of open myself up more to be more receptive to things that maybe I wasn't, maybe weren't in the bubble or box of what I thought was a fit for me. Mm -hmm. Um, And now, and I actually don't think I'm quite here yet. Like I think I'm in, I'm still in the open phase, Mm -hmm. you know, which I'm really enjoying. Like, you know, that's the default. Yes. All that. Um, 
But I do think that all of this will be what helps me better determine how to understand boundaries for myself. I think I've started to learn how to like let boundaries down to a certain extent in a healthy way. Yeah. Be more open, be a little bit more like scared, Mm. you know? I love that. Not as comfortable. I love that. I'm a person who like really likes to be comfortable. And I think I've learned. Most people. Yeah. And I think I'm learning to not be. And that like to not be is good. Um, And to not be in control is good. Um, So all of that I think is is really. That's really, really powerful right now. I love that. Last question. This is Geneva specific. Okay. Okay. Obviously, like everyone listening, active ingredient community is like one to join. Yeah. But for the active ingredient listener, knowing that it's like personal and professional growth, like people yeah. that like love like self improvement or just like routines and growing in all aspects, what are some communities that we can join? Ooh, I love that. Um, yeah, there's a bunch, especially in this realm. Um, I I think Jasmine's community, Female Founder World, is great. Guys, I highly recommend it. It's so yeah. good, especially if you're like starting a company or like wanting to like improve in your career. Yeah, yeah, that's an awesome one. Um, another one that I would say is well, I I just love uh Maddie and Scout from OK Sis mm. podcast. I think they're really great. I think there's a lot of podcast communities in this realm that are just really lovely and thoughtful chrissy uh rutherford does not have a podcast right just the newsletter no, okay just but the her, newsletter. so i'm in her geneva yeah, and i wonderful. love it and i'm like i feel like our communities are super super aligned yeah, there's a lot of like yeah. synced community yeah honestly. um so i would say hers too um and then this is kind of a a wild card one but Oh, another one is for anyone who's a writer, um, a community called Novella just launched and I'm obsessed with it. I'm not a writer, but it is really a really, really cool space. Mm. Um, So I highly recommend that. And then there are a bunch of very like specific communities. So like there's a community called Crypto Witch Club that I also love. And it's all about like learning about crypto and Web3. Very specific, very niche, but it's like oriented towards women. And so um I think it's a really, really cool space for like people who are like, I don't know much, but yeah. I want to learn. Like, I think there's so many communities on Geneva that are like kind of niche, yeah. but it makes it really, really cool. Cause if you're even just like remotely interested, you're like able in to it. deep dive yeah. with people who are like really in it or people who are new to it. Like, totally. You. Um, so, so yeah, I would say those are, are some that I, that I love amazing well this is so informative i love what you guys are doing at geneva i honestly think it's so needed and hopefully this is the first of many podcasts yeah yeah thank you so much for coming on